Hey there, welcome to the YouTube channel. I pray that this message encourages you and it helps you grow and become more like Jesus. And make sure you hit the subscribe button so you can continue to grow and learn more. Enjoy. And uh, we're going to turn to Matthew uh, chapter 1 today for our scripture. And we're in our series, Why Jesus Came. Why did he come to this earth? What is he up to? We, did, we talked about last week, he's the hope and the light and the joy of the world. And, and this week, I want to talk about how Jesus is the Savior of the world. For this will be a reminder for many of us as Christians. And for those of you who are still uh, seeking God and looking to you know, understand Jesus and to even believe in him, I, I pray this helps you understand why he even came in the first place. Let's go to Matthew 1, 1 uh, 18 through 25. That's where we're going to begin. This is about the birth of Jesus, the Messiah. It says in verse 18, this is how Jesus, the Messiah, was born. His mother, Mary, was engaged to be married to Joseph. But before the marriage took place, while she was still a virgin, she became pregnant through the power of the Holy Spirit. Joseph, her fiancé, was a good man and did not want to disgrace her publicly, so he decided to break off the engagement quietly. As he considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. Joseph, son of David, the angel said, Do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife. For the child within her was conceived by the Holy Spirit, and she will have a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All of this occurred to fulfill the Lord's message through his prophet. Look, the virgin will conceive a child. She will give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. When Joseph woke up, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded and took Mary as his wife, but he did not have sexual relations with her until her son was born, and Joseph named him Jesus. To help us understand this, this text, it's better that we uh, understand the context and this culture at this time, so we can kind of get an idea of how scandalous this appeared and how this would have caused a lot of drama. Now, I said this earlier, and it's pretty cheesy, but uh, <laughs> there's a lot... <laughs> There, I couldn't think of a Starbucks for that time, so I said there's probably a lot of gossip and talk at Stable Bucks, and the first service laughed just to be nice, you know, just to be nice, yeah. But I'm sure there was a lot of gossip and talk and just murmurings about what is going on here, and here's why. When uh, this, at this time, Couples were brought together through arrangements. And so parents would come together and they would arrange for their children to be married. And they would form up a contract and they would be betrothed to one another for at least one year. And so Mary and Joseph were betrothed to be married. And so it was almost like as if they were married, they were engaged. And what they had to do though is they had to live separate for a whole year to really just kind of see if they remain pure as well as if they stay faithful and as they grow and really to prepare themselves for the marriage as well. Get everything uh, lined up, everything they're supposed to do uh, to prepare. Uh, maybe work, uh, finances, preparations for the wedding, all those things. It was a big deal. So they would take an entire year and then at the end of the year, what would happen was the, the groom would come and take his bride uh, if, if everything was still okay, he would come and take his bride, and they would march back to the home, and then, then they would have a ceremony and then consummate the marriage together. And that made them officially married. So, as you can imagine, the fact that Mary is pregnant before that special day, this is causing some issues in the community. You understand? And so... Uh, Joseph reasons that, hey, you know what? And he's a really nice guy. He's a righteous man, as the word says. He decides that I'm not going to embarrass her. I don't want her to be disgraced publicly, so I'll divorce her quietly. And that way it won't get, uh, it won't escalate. Because, you know, in the law at this time, uh, someone who did this could be punished severely, even to be stoned or killed. So he didn't want that to happen. And uh, so he was going to divorce her, but God, God is good because God sends an angel in a dream to communicate to Joseph that it's not what you think. It's, it's not 
uh, what you fear. Instead, that the Holy Spirit has come upon Mary and God has placed, and God, is, to be honest with you, is in, G, uh, in Jesus. Jesus is in Mary and it's gonna be Jesus that is born. Now, uh, how do we explain that? I don't think the smartest person in the world could explain that. It's a miracle. It's a work of God. But I will say that the Holy Spirit was in the beginning at creation, hovering over the water, so the Holy Spirit can do what he does and work over Mary as he hovered over her, and Jesus was inside as a little baby born into her and placed into her. And so that's what took place, and Joseph now decides to stay married to her, and he goes and brings her home to live with him. But that is also a little scandalous because you don't do that until after a year. But he did this to help her out because she was pregnant. And that's why the last verse, make sure you understand that it says, but he did not have sexual relations with her until her son was born. And then Joseph named him Jesus. So I want you to understand that while this was very um, controversial, for the people in the community, God was working this all out, okay? And they were faithful to do what they were supposed to do to obey God's plans and wills, uh, his will for Jesus to come into this world. That's important for us to understand. Now, the important part here as well is the name of Jesus, why did he come to this earth? Who did he come for is in his name. Jesus is the Greek form of the Jewish or Hebrew name, Joshua. And Joshua means Jehovah is salvation. Jesus is salvation for the world. And he didn't come to save them from a physical ruler. He came to save them from the sin ruling in their hearts. He came to save us from the sin ruling in our hearts. Now, he was called Messiah, and so to the Jews, they were thinking this anointed king who could deliver them from the oppression of Rome, but that's not why Jesus came. And when they heard the word Messiah, they wouldn't think of a priestly role that could help remove sin. So they could be a little perplexed right now that Jesus' name means to save the people from their sins and that he was the Messiah. The, the main thing they wanted was to be delivered from physical oppression by, uh, by Rome. But instead, there was a greater enemy than Rome, and the greatest enemy against mankind is sin. Sin is the greatest enemy against all of us, and that is why Jesus came. There's something worse than physical oppression. There's spiritual oppression from sin. There's the separation from God. You know, sin is so damaging it's so deadly. It separates us from God. And it's that bad that God himself would come to earth to save us from it. Think about that for a moment. God himself in Jesus Christ, the flesh, Emmanuel, wanted you to be set free from the greatest enemy against your life. And that is sin. And the reason why is because sin leads to death and sin separates us from God. Now you're thinking, Ryan, this is supposed to be a joyous time of the year. Where's the happy, joyous sermon for Christmas time? Well, it is something to celebrate because sin is that deadly and we're saved from it. We should be excited that the Savior has been born unto us. But yeah, we have to deal with the first thing, the, the grave thing that's going on in our lives, the biggest concern, and, and it's in his name. His name is Jesus because he would save his people from his sins. He is salvation. The first thing Jesus wanted to deal with in our lives is what was going to keep us from eternal life. And the birth of Christ is the beginning of the greatest rescue mission the world has ever seen. The greatest one. And we need to be careful that we don't complicate this. We need to be careful that we don't complicate or ignore the reason Jesus came. It's rather simple. It's because of 
your sin and my sin and the mess that we created, what humanity has done. And I'm not trying to say you're a mess, but I tell you what, sin is messy. And mankind has messed up a lot of things in our world. And right now, sin is ravaging our world too, isn't it? And yet Jesus came so that every single person that was changed would do less of it and less of it and live a holy and good and pure life. And I thank God that Jesus came to clean up my mess personally, to, clean up, to come and take away my guilt and my shame. Now, Jesus came for all people too. He came to save everyone. And the clues are actually in his lineage before the text we read today, verses 1 through 17 of Matthew 1 talk about his lineage and really Mary and Joseph's lineage. And then Jesus is part of their family now because they're married and he comes from Mary and God and Joseph takes him as his father. And so now Jesus is attributed or connected now to the lineage of Mary and Joseph. And what's really interesting about this lineage is the people that are talked about in there. Well, you wouldn't expect that to be Jesus's lineage. Now, first of all, Women weren't usually mentioned in the Jewish customs of lineages. Um, unfortunately, women were looked down upon more than men, and we would disagree with that, and Jesus starts to change everything, thank God. Jesus begins to change those barriers and, and starts treating women with dignity and respect. Uh, but women weren't often added in, but Matthew made sure he added women into this lineage, which is great. But what's interesting about this is who he adds into the lineage. Only one of them is a Jew, and that's Mary. The other four are considered Gentiles. Why is that important? Because Matthew is writing to the Jewish church, and he's hoping that the Jews would believe in Jesus as the Messiah, the Savior of the world from our sins. But he uses Gentile women who were usually the Jews' enemies. For instance, uh, Tamar and Rahab, they're Canaanites. We know that Canaanites are the enemy of the Jews in the Old Testament. Or that Ruth was a Moabite. Or that Uriah's uh, wife, Bathsheba, well, and uh, someone who David cheated with and committed adultery with, well, she was a Hittite because she was married to a Hittite named Uriah. So the fact that, that Matthew would add these different people that are not Jews into his lineage was giving us a clue that Jesus came not for one blood type, but for all people. And that when you believe in Jesus Christ, you do become one blood in the blood of Jesus Christ. We're unified together, covered by the blood, the powerful blood of Jesus. It wasn't about just the Jewish nation that would be saved. It would be all nations can be saved because all have sinned. This would be consistent with scripture in other places like Romans, and it would be consistent in why Jesus was named the savior of the world because he would come and save his people from their sins. Now, if we look further into the lineage, God allowed and chose for some pretty messed up people with some messy lives be a part of his lineage. And I realize that we have some young ears in here Okay, I'm taking a drink of water just to give me a moment because I'm going to say some things that are pretty heavy and it might, it might turn into some conversations later, just so you know. But Jesus' lineage, let me say this too up front. Jesus was perfect. He was not a sinner. But the lineage that was connected to him was full of sinful people, men and women. And here's an example. Uh, and just so you know, when you peel back this genealogy and you read the stories of these people, you go, whoa, there are some messed up people in this lineage. For instance, Judah, a Jew who had sex with his daughter-in-law thinking she was a prostitute. Tamar, a Gentile woman who bore two sons out of incest. Or Rahab, a Canaanite, or a Canaanite prostitute. Or Ruth, a Moabite, and the Moabite lineage began with incest between Lot and one of his own daughters. Or David, a king who committed adultery and murder. 
and Bathsheba, the one he committed adultery with, the woman who committed adultery with David. And by the way, in order for David to do that, he had Uriah killed because they end up being pregnant. This is the lineage that was connected and attributed to Mary and Joseph and ultimately to Jesus. Why am I saying this? Jesus Christ was willing to come from a humiliating lineage, a lineage his father chose for him to show us that no past is so shameful that God cannot make it beautiful. <laughs> Praise the Lord. No matter what you have done in your past, Jesus Christ is not ashamed to call you his brother or sister. Wow. Wow. That's a redeeming God, a God that can redeem your life. I don't know how ugly your past has been, how bad it was, how sinful it was. I'm not sure. Only God truly knows. And even if you don't have one that everyone knows about, we all know inside that we've had evil thoughts and evil things that we've thought of it doing or imagining or all those kind of things, right? We have that. We cannot be self-righteous just because we didn't publicly make mistakes. We are just as guilty as, of sin as well. And yet, that's the reason why Jesus came, was to clean us up, to set us free from sin, to pay the penalty of our sin, which is death and separation from God. He came to clean up the mess that we started. And why did it have to be Jesus? Now, I did not expect to use this scripture during Christmas time, but it's okay because this is the gospel and we're talking about Jesus here, not just Christmas, right? We're talking about the birth of Jesus. Romans 5, would you turn to that? And I also have it on the screen for you if you prefer that. But Romans chapter 5, 12 through 21, it had to be Jesus that was born to save us from our sin. It had to be him. This is what the scripture says. Oops, I went to Romans 12. Romans 5, verse 12. When Adam sinned, sin entered the world. Adam's sin brought death, so death spread to everyone, for everyone sinned. That's right. No one here is perfect, and we've all fallen in our sin. Yes, people sinned even before the law was given. But it was not counted as sin because there was not yet any law to break. Still, everyone died from the time of Adam to the time of Moses, which is when the law came in. Even those who did not disobey an explicit commandment of God, as Adam did. Now, Adam is a symbol, a representation of Christ who was yet to come. But there is a great difference between Adam's sin and God's gracious gift. For the sin of this one man, Adam, brought death to many, but even greater is God's wonderful grace and his gift of forgiveness to many through this other man, Jesus Christ. And the result of God's gracious gift is very different from the result of that one man's sin. For Adam's sin led to condemnation, but God's free gift leads to our being made right with God, even though we are guilty of many sins. Who's the free gift? He's talking about Jesus that his one free gift has made us right with God, even though we are guilty of many sins. For the sin of this one man, for the sin of this one man, Adam, caused death to rule over many, but even greater is God's wonderful grace and his gift of righteousness for all who receive it will live in triumph over sin and death through this one man, Jesus Christ. Yes, Adam's, sin, or Adam's one sin brings condemnation for everyone, but Christ's one act of righteousness brings a right relationship with God and new life for everyone. Because one person disobeyed God, many became sinners. But because one other person obeyed God, many will be made righteous. This is the gospel here. This is the good news. God's law was given so that all people could see how sinful they are. See, the law, it revealed what sin is, what right and wrong is, but it did not have the ability to remove the heart that was prone to sin. We needed to be reborn and have the Holy Spirit in us to live a sinless life and to live a life that would follow Jesus, a life tender to obey. 
And we talked about that in our Holy Spirit series. So verse 21, or I'm sorry, let me finish that. But as people sinned more and more, God's wonderful grace became more abundant. What is he talking about here? The world was getting real bad before Jesus was born. A lot of sin. Well, God sent Christ to be even greater than all that sin to deal with it. So just as sin ruled over all people and brought them to death, now God's wonderful grace rules instead here in our hearts, giving us right standing with God and resulting in eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Jesus accomplishes what Adam couldn't. Jesus accomplishes what we couldn't. We couldn't live a sinless life. So Jesus is Emmanuel, God with us, living in the flesh to live a perfect and sinless life so that he can become the ultimate sacrifice that would save us from our sins. Now, do you remember when I said last week, Isaiah 61, 1 through 3, and the call to worship? I want to read that again because I was talking about why Jesus came and it's going to be on the screen for you as well. And this is, this is from Isaiah. But Jesus opens this scroll and reads it in the temple when he begins his ministry. And he reads a portion of it. But I want to read to you this part right here. And I want you to see who Jesus came for. It says, I, the spirit of the sovereign Lord, is on me because the Lord has appointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners. <clears throat> to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn and provide for those who grieve in Zion, to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of joy instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. They will be called oaks of righteousness, <clears throat> a planting of the Lord for the display of his splendor. That's beautiful, right? He came because we were messed up. That's what it says. That's why he came. He didn't come because you have it all together. He didn't come because your life was perfect. You were so unworthy. I'm so unworthy of being saved. <clears throat> if there was a reason for God not to help, that would be it. We would repel God. Our sins should repel him. It should keep him away. But God's grace is that amazing that he would leave eternity. Our sin is so bad that only Jesus himself could save us. And he came for us. And he did it, and he didn't just stop there. Not only did he save us, but then he gives us a life of joy a garment of praise, beauty instead of ashes. He redeems your past. He makes you a new person. He gives you a new heart, a new mind. I mean, the best thing of all is he gives you eternal life too. Without pain or sorrow, without tears or fear, praise the Lord. And as Christians, I think we can kind of forget that after a while. Every Christmas we celebrate, every, every, every time we do communion, he didn't have to come. He forgave you before you even recognized you needed forgiveness. God demonstrates his love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. I thank God that he came to set me free. I thank God he came to set you free. <clears throat> I thank God that my past didn't push God away, but it's actually what brought him here. He's not ashamed to walk into your life and say, I love you. Now be different. Change. Walk away from that sin. We got to remember something. He didn't die so we can keep enjoying the sin. He died so we would stay away from it. 
He wants us to repent. He wants us to walk away from that. In fact, he gives us a heart, a new heart and a new mind that also wants to. So I'm so grateful for the Holy Spirit who convicts me and keeps me from going down this path and gives me the right path to walk on. But here's the gospel too, and out of, out of, amen, out of Romans 5. Here, here's the good news. Adam was a mess. We're a mess. Jesus wasn't. He was whole. He was complete. He had it together. Think about that for a moment. He was never broken emotionally, mentally, even physically, not one bone broken on the cross. His body was pierced and broken for us, but not one bone broken for us. He was whole. He was perfect. He was sufficient for us. Why am I saying this? The good news is, is that Jesus was never a mess because you have to be perfect in order to clean up everyone else's messes. And I'm going to really quick just encourage you to really quit looking to humans to fix your mess. To quit looking. Yes. I don't, there's not enough drink you can have that's going to fix your problems. There's not enough drugs. If you're watching online, you're in this room and you need to hear this today. Listen, there's not enough TV that's going to make you feel better. There's not enough food that's going to make you feel better. There's not enough relationships or sex or anything like that or debauchery or, or pleasure that's going to make you feel better. None of that can fulfill the God-shaped hole in your life where Jesus belongs. None of it will. None of it will satisfy. Jesus came to fix you, to save you from the things that for some reason we chase after and they don't even deliver. His name means deliverer. His name means deliverer. He is the deliverer. I'm talking to someone who doesn't know this yet or maybe a Christian who has just been right back into the stuff we shouldn't be. And let's not be self-righteous, right? Right? Let's check ourselves. Let's not be the first one to pick up a stone. We got to check ourselves. Are we getting back into stuff we shouldn't be that he set us free from? Turn away from it today because it's going to cause a mess in your life. It's going to cause another mess. I just want to encourage you with something closing. I want you to know how much God loves you. This hit me hard this past couple weeks looking at the narratives. You know, my, my favorite, one of my favorite scriptures for Christmas is John 3, 16. I love that one. And verse 17. I'm going to read it for you. Let this sink in. I know it's on the screen, but I like to read it from my Bible too. John 3, 16. For God loved the world so much that he gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. God sent his son into the world, not to judge the world, but to save the world through him. Whew. That's how much God loves you. The birth of Christ is packed with prophecies being fulfilled. Words being spoken hundreds of years before it ever started and then, be, and then being fulfilled. Miracles, like an older woman like named Elizabeth, as we learned last week, having a child. Mary, a virgin, having a child through the power of the Holy Spirit, the work of the Holy Spirit. When they were in danger, God directed them to not go back to certain places. When the Magi were supposed to return back to Herod, an angel said, don't go that way. Miracles, protection, God orchestrating and working everything out for Jesus. Why? Because he loves us. God works out so many details in your life, you have no idea. You have no idea the plans of God, the will. I don't either. I don't even get, I don't even understand how God works half the time. I really don't. I try, I don't get it. 
He's an amazing God. He's working out everything for our good, for those who love him, the word says. He's working it out. He's always taking care of things that we don't even see going on. And he worked out this Christmas narrative and these stories and these events. Why? Well, one, for his son to be successful and to move forward. But really, too, because he was the savior of the world, he was your savior. He was thinking about you at the birth of Christ when he said, call him Jesus. That's how much he loves you. I think the cross is, a, is the best demonstration of his love. No doubt. But it started in the manger. It started in Bethlehem. Him working out everything for your salvation. Christmas, for Christians, for me, reminds us to be humble and stay humble. Stay humble. Jesus came to save you to save me, the person who's betrayed you, the person who has hurt you, the person that is persecuting us as Christians, the people, the nations. Do you know what? Jesus died for them too. When Jesus was being crucified and he was being when he's being accused of these lies, he didn't speak. He didn't try to defend himself. He didn't have to. He was pure. He was honest. He was truth. He didn't have to defend himself. I am stretched by the love of God by the grace of God for people that would come against us, come against me, to show them love, to show them grace. As hard as it can be, I'm reminded to stay humble because I once was like them. Christmas reminds us that only Jesus is the sufficient savior of the world that can fix everything that has gone on in our lives and in this world. Christmas reminds us how much God truly loves us, reminds us to thank God for coming and rescuing us. But you know what? Christmas reminds us that if Jesus can leave eternity and travel eternity to be here, we can walk across the street and tell someone and show someone the love of Jesus. We can walk across the street. We can walk across the office. We can throw a post online. We can make a phone call. We can throw a text out. We can do that. He traveled so far. God did so much to say, to get the gospel out and to say, I love you. We can do that, right? I saw a prayer that I felt really fit this message today from A.W. Tozer, a pastor I like to follow. He passed many years ago, but I like to follow him and learn from him because his zeal for God is his zeal for holiness and the word. And he had a very humble, real prayer as a pastor. And I thought, wow, this would be great for anyone, whether you're a believer in Christ, not forgiven for your sin yet, not realizing you've been forgiven, not accepting that yet, or maybe you're a Christian. This is the kind of prayer. This is a humble prayer right here. Listen to these words. Father, I want to know you. I want to know thee. But my coward heart fears to give up its toys. I cannot part with them without inward bleeding. What is he saying there? He's saying there's things that he's attached to in this world, things of, of the flesh and of sin that he knows it's going to take a fight to get rid of in his life. And I do not try to hide from thee the terror of the parting from these things. I come trembling, but at least I come. Come on now. It's hard to come to Christ and say, I give up these things, but do it. At least come to him. Give up the sin. Please root from my heart all those things which I have cherished so long and which have become a very part of my living self so that you may enter 
and dwell there without a rival, without a rival, no competition. Remove these sins and so that you rule and reign. He reigns above it all, right? We, we sang that. No rival in our hearts. Then you make the place of thy feet glorious. Then shall my heart have no need of the sun to shine in it. No physical need for sun, for the sun, for thyself will be the light of it. And there shall be no night there, meaning no darkness, no wickedness, no sin. In Jesus' name, amen. Wow. Maybe that's a prayer that you need to pray today. God, I come to you. Let's close our eyes and let's pray. As believers, maybe you're still seeking God and you have not believed in him for salvation. Today is the time. Now is the time. There's a reason why you're hearing this message. Christmas is about salvation from sin, not cookies. Not Christmas trees. None of that. None of that's going to reserve a spot in heaven for you. None of that is going to set you free. You're still going to be feel in despair and there won't be any peace. There won't be any joy in your life. By the way, if you want real peace in your life, then turn away from sin and turn towards Christ. And as Christians, if you want to have continual peace, we should not delve or participate in sin. It does not bring peace. It brings conflict. If you want true joy, find Jesus, believe in him. We've been talking about him today. Let him set you free, and then you will find true peace and true joy. And walk in obedience, and you will find continual peace and joy. But if that's you today, you need to pray these things. God, there's fleshly, sinful things in my heart that I am going to have to let go of to follow you, to believe in you. God, I pray we would have the courage today to remove them from our lives in Jesus' name. And God, we thank you that Jesus is more than enough. He's sufficient. He's greater than all the things that could be attached into our hearts and minds. All the things that have rivaled with you and have taken your place, God, we confess them right now and we give them up right now. And even if we have to remove physical things in our lives that are not of you, we would go home and do that immediately, God. Lord, cleanse us from the inside out, Lord. We walk away from those things. God, you've called us to a life of holiness and obedience. You came to save us from that ugly sin and the damage of it. And Lord, as Christians, we want to be humble and stay humble and respect and be grateful for what you did for us, everything you've orchestrated for us. And if you're in this place today and you haven't known this love for you, this love that would be honest and tell you that without the removal of the guilt of sin in your life. You won't have eternal life. You won't have eternal peace. You won't have eternal joy. I'm keeping it real because the Bible keeps it real. You must trust in Jesus as your Lord and Savior today. Nothing else, no one else will fulfill you. Nothing else can complete you. Would you ask Jesus to be your Lord and Savior right now? Put your trust in him right now. Say a prayer from your heart that I see my sin, I recognize why you came. It was to save me from the penalty of my sin, which is death and separation and hell. Thank you for doing that, God. I receive your forgiveness. I receive a new heart, a new mind. I receive your spirit. Come into me and make me a new person, a new creation. And as a as an act of worship and as a gift to you, I will give you my life back to you. If you would say that prayer today, a spiritual transaction in the kingdom of God has taken place and you are now born again and you're now a child of God and it deserves praise and glory because you've been changed. And you know what, real quick, with your eyes closed, if that was you today, would you raise a hand? Would you raise a hand if you said that prayer? I see hands going up. Awesome. Praise the Lord. Thank the Lord. We have salvations. Can we give God glory and praise right now? Thank the Lord. Praise God. 
Thank you, God. Not shying away from salvation, because that's why Jesus came. Not shying away from telling the truth today, because that's why Jesus came. The greatest gift you could ever receive is Jesus Christ. The greatest gift you receive is freedom from that sin and having Jesus Christ. And you are free indeed today, church. You are freed indeed, all you new salvations, new believers. You are free. And that's why we can celebrate Christmas with joy. That's why we can. God, we thank you for this day. Be with us as we go our separate ways. Thank you for the reminder, the simple reminder of the gospel. Thank you for thinking of us, for loving us that much that you would send Jesus. And thank you, Jesus, for obeying and living a sinless, perfect life for us. We worship you with our lives in response. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.